الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد أو praises due to Allah and we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to his companions and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the day of resurrection. Do you really know him? Do you really know him? It's a question which one should ask himself not once in a lifetime, not once a year, not once a month. Rather, it is a question that one should ask himself always, as often as one can. Muslims, or let's rephrase that, some Muslims think that they know him when in fact they really don't. And what is worse than that is that it doesn't stop with them not knowing him. Not only are they ignorant concerning him, but they go to the extent of inviting and propagating their ignorance and bringing other people into the same stage or the same situation therein where also the other people can no longer know him. All this while claiming exactly the opposite in the name of intellect and philosophy. So the question remains, do you, re do you really know him but according to who? Everyone knows him according to some way or some person or some philosophy. The Jews know him in their own distorted way. The Christians know him in their own distorted way. The Hindus know him in their own distorted way. And the list goes on and some Muslims, and the Muslims know him, but it is very sad to say that we are not unified when it comes to knowing him. You will find that perhaps in this auditorium, shouldn't go far, you will find that perhaps a few will be those who agree based on textual evidences about who he really is. You will find some outlandish ideologies and concepts amongst people who are very close to us. I've had my own, you know, first-hand experience regarding that. The one thing, however, which no two Muslims should disagree on is the fact that the messengers were sent with a unified and universal message. And that message is the message of what? Tawheed. No one can deny that. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ And we have not sent a messenger before you except that we revealed unto him that there is no deity worthy of worship except me, so except I also worship me. Fa'abudun. And Allah said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ And we have sent forth amongst every nation a messenger saying to the people, worship Allah alone and avoid false gods. That's every messenger. Now notice the wording. وَمَا بَعَثْنَا قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فَمَنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ يعني Allah is negating. No messenger was sent except that his da'wah was that of Tawheed. And the question remains, how much of that Tawheed do we understand? Is it the typical, ordinary, casual understanding that Allah is the creator, Allah is the sustainer, Allah is the provider. If so, this is not good enough and not sufficient. Because you and uh, Abu Lahab and Abu Talib and Abu Jahl 
and others among his kuffar had the same belief system. They had the same belief system. In fact, the Jews and the Christians predominantly, to a large extent, believe the same thing. A minority of people deny Allah's rububiyyah. It is agreed upon to a large extent. There's a difference always, but we're saying. Is it the fact that Allah Azzawajal is to be worshipped alone in terms of uluhiyya? Yes. That's what makes us special. However, amongst the Muslims, this is almost agreed upon. Except those who fell into the, you know, worship of the dead, or some of the early Shia and their veneration of Ali, like Abdullah ibn Saba who told Ali, Anta al-ilah haq, haqqan, you are the real God. And so Ali had no choice but to burn him up, him and his followers, as sabaiyya you find that hardly would a Muslim disagree with you that Allah needs to be worshipped alone. So where is the difference? The difference is in the third category of Tawheed, Tawheed al-Asma'i wa sifat The oneness and uniqueness of Allah concerning His names and His attributes. This is where the differing has occurred. So the concept of Tawheed, whether it is the Rububiyya or Uluhiyya or Asma'u Sifat, it is intended to bring to mind, so it can cling with us, that Allah is the Creator and we are the creation. Which means that we, we worship Allah in veneration, in exaltation, in fear, in love, in hope, in reliance, in awe. The whole thing, the whole purpose of life is to identify that concerning Allah and so we may free ourselves from all worldly restrictions so we may, you know, long for that greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal, that relationship with Him which will inevitably enable someone to be admitted to paradise and protected from the hellfire. Now that cannot happen if we don't know who Allah is. And it cannot happen if we don't give it its due time. And it cannot happen if we believe and accept philosophical arguments when it comes to what the Sahaba believed concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is mandatory on everyone to have the sound aqeedah because that is the thing which will protect you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah even if you had some other deeds which were not pleasing to Allah. However, many good deeds or what appears to be good deeds to the people with the wrong aqeedah will be of no value. Aqeedah then is the most important thing without a doubt. Now, innovations began early on. And it is no shock to any one of us because the Prophet wasallam said what? فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Whoever amongst you lives after me, min ba'di, he shall see a lot of differing, a lot of conflicts, a lot of contradictions among the way the people act and behave. So he told us sallallahu alayhi wasallam that things will happen. And the first bid'ah is that of the khawarij, which actually did not happen after the Prophet it happened during his time. And you all know Khuwaisira, we mentioned the story before, who said to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Muhammad, I'dil, O Muhammad be just, and we know his story, if you go back to the text of Wahhabism, or Sufism, one of these two, we address that issue over there. So it began with the Khawarij. And the Bid'ah began concerning things of the belief or the disbelief of a Muslim depending on his deeds. So they used to declare the one who commits a major sin as a Kafir. This bid'ah was followed with the bid'ah of al qadariyya who appeared at the time of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu and others among the Sahaba who refuted them back then. And al qadariyya was the claim that Allah Azza wa Jal did not decree everything we're doing. He did not do it, it just happens like that. And the extremes amongst them used to say that not only that Allah didn't decree what we're doing, in fact, Allah didn't even know about it until after it happened. Which is ajeeb. Yani, which means that Allah discovers events after 
their existence. Before that, he neither decreed them nor did he know them. But they were there. And the Qadaniya were followed with the Al Irja, Al Murjia. Those who said that your Imam is fixed, it is permanent, it doesn't change with your deeds. So, in other words, whether you commit zina, you drink alcohol, you steal, you, you do all kinds, you kill people, you're still a sound believer as long as you believe in Allah, His angels, His messengers, you know, uh, the, the last day in preordainment to what have you. This six pillars of Iman, the six pillars of Iman. So, they said Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and the worst person among the Ummah are equal in faith. Ajib. But these are bid'ah for you. People say bid'ah, brother, you always say bid'ah, bid'ah. Well, here's a, here's a nice sample for you. Do you to know what bid'ah leads to? What is Christianity today but a bid'ah? From the deal of Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam. Everything they have now is nothing but a bid'ah which they invented. Until they lost their religion altogether. It was gone. Alhamdulillah. Allah azza wa jal promised that he will protect his deen until the end of time. But how is it protected? By people of knowledge and du'at addressing these violations and these innovations so that the truth will always prevail and be available for those who seek it. If everybody remains silent, then that would defeat the purpose. So either we get involved or we watch on the sideline. After the murjia came the jahmiyyah. Jahm ibn Safwan, alayhi min Allahi ma yastahiq. He is the head of these problems and calamities which we have concerning the names and attributes of Allah until today. Because from that came the Mu'tazila. And the basic understanding of these two groups are as follows. They themselves divided into four groups. Listen to this now. If you haven't been shocked before, get ready for this one. The Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila, their views are, first, it is not permissible to describe Allah with neither existence nor non-existence. Because if you say that Allah exists, then you are comparing Allah to other existing beings. And if you say that Allah doesn't exist, then you are comparing Allah to other non-existing non -existing beings. So you can neither say Allah exists, nor can you say Allah is non-existent. What do you have left? Nothing. And you cannot say Allah exists. Now if I ask you, does Allah exist? Does anyone have to think twice before he says, of course? But they say you cannot say that. Because supposedly you are resembling Allah to created beings when you affirm existence or when you affirm non-existence. Another group of philosophers among them, maybe less intelligent than they were, they said, we describe him with negation but not affirmation. Uh, for example, you cannot say Allah is living. You say Allah is not dead. You cannot say Allah is alim, knowledgeable, but you can say Allah is not ignorant. And the list goes on. So anything which affirms Allah's attribute, they say it's haram. However, you can negate whatever you want. So there's negation, no affirmation. Ajib. The third amongst them they said, we affirm the names without the attributes. And these are the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila, as they say, you say Allah is Qadir, because Allah said, in Allah ala kulli shayin, Qadir. They said, we say Allah is Qadir, but without Qudra. Yani Allah is Qadir with the name, without the quality of omnipotence. The one who's able to do all things, they said, no, you cannot describe Allah with that. But Allah called himself Qadir, so we keep it. So Allah is Hay, but he's not really Hay. He's Alim, but not really Alim. He's Basir, but not really Basir. And the list goes on. It's only a name, but there isn't a, a, any essence or any attribute in reference or to support that name. And the last ones are the Ashaira, who are the least destructive among them, but still off the path. They said, we affirm the names of Allah and only seven attributes. 
Which attributes were there? Were, were those the ones which made sense to them? The ones which were in agreement with their distorted logic, they said we believe. And they believed in the life of Allah, Al Hayat, Al Kalam, the speech of Allah, Al Basar, the seeing of Allah, Al Sama, the hearing of Allah, Al Will, Iradatullah, Ilm, the knowledge of Allah, and power, Qudratullah. That's it. They believed in seven, and all of the rest they denied. So these are. Now you say, um, where are these people? I will tell you, go online. If you think that this is some, we're speaking about some, you know, uh, hypothetical group of people who don't really exist, you would be, you would be shocked to realize and to find out that perhaps these are the majority. You go online and you see what the websites contain when it comes to this issue. I personally have received tens of emails because of the lecture, Where is Allah? There's a lecture titled, Where is Allah? We spoke about the belief system of al Sunnah wal Jama'ah concerning Allah Azza wa Jal. You listen to the Masayib, that this, this kind of nonsense and others that the people bring forth, which you think no way a Muslim would say, no way a Muslim would believe. But these are very prevalent nowadays. This is why it is necessary to learn the Aqeedah from the right sources. And if a group of people or a, a denomination or a sect in Islam does not pay attention to these things, then needless to say, you should be even more careful when it comes to joining them or going with them or participating with them, even with good intentions. Because your Aqeedah may be distorted very, very quickly. And Fada'il A'mal and Fada'il Sadaqat is not too far from these facts. Read the end of the book, read the crazy stories which they contain, and see what kind of aqidah it betrays to the average listener who doesn't know any better, who perhaps doesn't even know the Arabic language, and if he reads the Quran in English, he may not understand the implication of the ayat, and may easily be led astray because of some, some wicked content in these books. So, be very careful. The Aqeedah is to be learned from the authors and the followers and the shuyukh of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. If you want to know how to identify them, where to find them, then this is what we will be doing in this lecture inshaAllah. You will learn the sound Aqeedah, then you will have a radar from now on, inshaAllah. Anytime you hear or you see something which conflicts with these usul, you will be able to know that this is a place which you need to avoid. It doesn't mean that we go to extremes. We give him da'wah, we try to bring him you know, to, to the right aqidah with the good preaching as the Prophet ﷺ did because the mubtadi'een are, are dominant. So if we boycott them, then we will be alone and they will remain straight. And at the end of the day, no matter what people say, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. You will not truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So we must love for them the right aqidah, like you love for yourself the right aqidah. Don't say Alhamdulillah they're going to go to Jahannam. We told them they didn't listen. No, that's not the attitude. We continue to try and strive to bring him to the truth. Nevertheless, we don't want to get. You know, uh, we don't want to get hurt in the process by us ruling our aqidah unless we have the right understanding from the beginning. Inshallah, this lecture will provide you with that. Now, what is the position of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Al Firq al Najiya, wa Ta'ifat al Mansura, the save, the save, the aided sect? Qala Shaykh Rasul ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah fi al Aqidah al Wasitiyah. من الإيمان بالله الإيمان بما وصف به نفسه في كتابه وبما وصفه به رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم رسوله محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Part of our belief in Allah When Jibreel came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم He told him أن تؤمن بالله أخبرني عن الإيمان قال أن تؤمن بالله To believe in Allah Part of the Iman, your Iman in Allah is to believe in whatever Allah described Himself with in His book. 
and whatever his Prophet Muhammad وسلم, described them with in the Sunnah. Whether it is qawliya, verbal, fi'liya in his actions, or taqririya in his acknowledgments and his approvals alayhi salatu wasalam. And we have references from all three. Now concerning this statement of Shaykh Al-Sabi ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh bin Al-Fami rahmallah had some comments to make. First, the implications. When we say what Allah described Himself with, which is His names and attributes, this means that the existence of a mere essence devoid of attributes is not possible. For example, when we say what Allah described Himself with, meaning Allah must have an essence, because there is no such thing as essence without attributes. Anything which exists must have some qualities for you to even say this exists. If it didn't have any attributes, then it doesn't exist. So it is, uh, it is necessary that that which is described, it must have attributes for it to be really existent. So Allah exists, so His attributes exist. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first implication. The second implication, belief in them is from the knowledge of the unseen. The belief in the names and attributes of Allah. Is it something which you learn from a philosopher? Is it something which you read in the Hindu scriptures? Where do you get it from? Answer me. Where do you learn about Allah from? Quran? Let's call them textual evidences. Textual evidence, meaning from the text. It's an evidence that is based on the text, meaning by the text, the Quran and the Sunnah. The fact that they come from the Quran and the Sunnah means you must, you cannot add anything from outside. You cannot do ishtihad, you cannot exert your knowledge to deduce new names and attributes. You must refer to the Quran and the Sunnah because Allah told us that among the things which He has made haram, وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ To say that about Allah which you do not know. So, we must refer to textual evidences. We learn about Allah's names and attributes, not from our intellect like the Ash'ira or the Mu'tazila, no, from the textual evidences. So anything that Allah said in the Quran, you must believe in. I must believe in, every Muslim must believe in. And we will give some examples in a little bit, inshaAllah. Thirdly, oh, let me give you an example, sorry. Jannah. You know Jannah? Has anyone been to Jannah? Uh, because among the Christians this is common. You know, they go, supposedly they die. I read this uh, not that long ago, someone sent an email. Oh, a Christian lady, she died and she was, in, 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 uh, she was dead for I don't know how many days, right? Or how many hours? I think 72 hours. And in the 72 hours, she went to the life to come, she met Jesus. And Jesus told her, he was crying. He said, you know, tell the people they need to return to me, blah, 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 blah. Right? Amazing. And so, uh, when they sent her name, I looked up, you know, I looked it up on Google, it turned out to be a half-naked lady. Lady, and she's, what she's wearing tells you everything you need to know about her. Khalas, enough. You went over there, you spoke to Jesus, and he gave you all this information. You were a stripper the other day. And you didn't even bother to change. You're going to bring us, you know, life, news from the life to come. She died, she came back with news from the unseen. Told the people what they need to do so they can go, you know, get their salvation. Well, in, in Islam, we don't have that, Habibi. What the Prophet وسلم, saw, Allah made him see. What you see in a dream, that's something else. But to die and come back, that defeats the purpose of belief bil ghayb. Al iman bil ghayb is no longer a point. Anyways, have you seen Jannah? You have not seen Jannah. You have not seen Jannah. However, do we have textual evidences concerning Jannah? We do. We know fiha rumman, wa fiha fawakih, fiha fakiha, hur al-ain. We have names. But no matter what you do, you cannot find out the essence of them. So then, the existence of the textual evidence doesn't mean that you will know the essence of the thing. It just means that you have a glimpse of it. And the same thing concerning your soul. The soul is in your, it's on your own body. If it goes away, you're dead. You're nothing. So we believe in the textual evidences and we have to refer to them when it comes to knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, 
We do not describe Allah with what He did not describe Himself with. Because this is also very common. That people will add names to Allah or they will add sifat to Allah. I remember someone told me, I, you know, back in some other place, uh, I, I said something to him which he thought was impressive, right? He told me uh, in, in Arabic, he said, not to do me, Allah zalim. <laughs> he said, don't oppress me, Allah is the oppressor. I said, Ya Shaykh, Ittaqi la ya rajal. He doesn't know. You believe it? He's a Muslim. And for whatever reason, it is common among some of these Middle Eastern countries that Allah is a zalim. Even though you read all over the Quran, in Allah la yazlimu nasa shay'an. And Allah doesn't oppress anyone. وَمَا رَبُّكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ الْعَبِينَ No, they say Allah is a zalim. You cannot say that. This is haram and kufr. To say that Allah wrongs anyone or oppresses anyone in any way, shape or form. We cannot do that. Fourthly, holding on to the evidences according to their apparentness, which means according to their apparent meaning, without exceeding that. Yani whatever the names and attributes, whatever they imply, you have to stick to that implication. You cannot go beyond that. You cannot add anything or delete. We have to take it as it means. Allah says, كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام. Everything upon it shall perish, and the face of your Lord will remain. The text of heaven says, وجه ربك. You have no choice, nor do you have the authority. To go into this ayah and try to add anything or delete anything. The ayah says, Waju Rabbika, you stop right there. And we know that it, it, we don't look at it as parts, as human beings, meaning Allah's face and then it's something else. You don't think about Allah like you think of a human being in bits and pieces, in body parts. And you don't say that the face of Allah means the glory of Allah or the might of Allah or whatever other ta'aweel or taharif, taharif that the people of Bid'ah bring. You have to believe Allah has a face. Allah has a face. That's part of the belief system of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Don't ask how, because we will learn later that you don't have the right to ask how. But we tell you one thing, there's nothing like Allah. So you neither deny what Allah said, nor do you compare Allah to His creation or liken Allah to His creation. You have to stick to the textual evidence. Fifthly, there's no room for intellect. Don't impose the Aristotle philosophy when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. Why? If I say right now, 55 times 44, how many have an answer? 55, without a calculator. 55 times 44. Fine, 8 times 8. Okay, how many people answered? And some are still thinking. And some will not finish by the end of the lecture. You know, until he pulls out the calculator without anyone seeing him. 64, yeah, I know it was 64 the whole time. Why? My brain is not like your brain, not like his brain. Everybody has a brain, which Allah gave him according to a measurement that Allah knows. So if we were going to impose our intellect in the names and attributes of Allah, you would wind up like the Hindus with a million God. Correct? People will understand things differently. So your, your aql, ma'alish, with all due respect to it, leave it at home. As in, don't use it to conflict with the evidences. Use it to understand the evidences, but not to oppose the evidences. Uh, I'll give you something. People deny Allah's eyes. Even though, because the intellect said, how can Allah have eyes? Well, that's your intellect, Akhi. But Allah said, He had eyes. And there are multiple evidences, three to four in the Quran. Speaking about the Ark of Noah. Uh, speaking to Musa. Speaking to the Prophet All of these are terms where eyes were used. 
And we must believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has eyes. Now when your brain starts to imagine something, we say, shut it off. When you want to come up with an image, we say you don't have the right to do that. Because no matter what you think of, you're wrong. No matter what imagery you develop, you're wrong. And so you're attributing to Allah that which He doesn't deserve. But the other extreme is, say, okay, then Allah doesn't have eyes. Yeah, but the ayah said that. And we will see the position of the Sahaba concerning that. The hands of Allah. And be careful. If you're a khatib or you're a lecturer, when it comes to these, because I've seen many khutaba say that, they say, Allah will hold the earth with his hand. We say, put that behind your back. Because once you say that, then you've likened Allah's hand to yours. I only showed you this as an example, right? You don't use your own, you know, things to try to bring to life. People know what hand means. Just say that. Allah Azza wa Jal said to Iblis, ma mana'aka? And tasjud lima khalaqtu biyadayk. What prevented you from prostrating to, the, to he who I'm, whom I've created with my two hands? And if you know Arabic, you will know that this is muthanna. Muthanna, dual. Furthermore, Allah said about the Jews that they said, Yadullahi maghlula. The hand of Allah is tight. Ghullat aydihim. Allah made dua against them. And Allah Azza wa will reply. But nay, their hands will be tight. And they are the cheapest people on earth, FYI. Bel yadahu, later on Allah says, Bel yadahu mabsutatan. Nay, but both of his hands are extended and stretched out. He spends as he wills, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you know Arabic, you will know that the yadah means two hands. Don't think of your hand because you're a creature and Allah is the creator. And there's a huge difference between the creature and the creator. So you have to believe, but you can't go beyond that. The same thing concerning Allah's ascension over the throne. Allah's rising over the throne. Ar-Rahman ala al-Arshi istawa. Allah rose over his throne. How? Don't ask how. And it's none of your business, as you will see later on. But you believe that. Allah is descending to the lowest heaven every last third of the night, every night. I mean, the Prophet وسلم, said in Bukhari to the Arabs who knew Arabic, Yanzilu Rabbuna Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Our Lord descends. Yanzil. Everybody knows what Yanzil means. It means to descend. To go down. Again, you believe. Because that's what the Sahaba believed. And the Tabi'een believed. And Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Hanifa. And Malik and Shafi and Ahmed believed. And Dhabi and Ibn Taymiyyah and Bukhari believed. All of them believed that. We can pick the ulama from among the major ulama who went off in this regard. We can count them on the fingers. But the vast majority, they were on this aqidah. This sound, beautiful, wonderful aqidah which puts us in our place. Submit to Allah. Believe what Allah said in the Quran. Otherwise, if you don't believe that, then you are saying that the book of Allah is not what Allah said in the beginning of the Quran. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ If you believe that all of these ayat have hidden meanings and subliminal meanings and, and you know something which is appeared and something which is secret and what have you, then you're saying in other words that the book of Allah is not as Allah said there's no doubt in it, you're saying it's full of doubt. But that's not the case. Even the things which are ambiguous, Allah told us that muhtamat wa mutashabihat. That there are ayat muhtamat which are entirely clear and others which require Understanding in the light of the muhtamat. Everything has a tafsir ala kulli hal. Illa ma huwa lillahi azza wa jal. But the names and attributes of Allah is something which the Sahaba understood and so did the generations who followed them. Now, uh, we must point out to the fact that what is perfection for human beings can be considered as a defect if it is attributed to Allah and the other way around. Right now, sleep. 
Sleeping. Is it something which is good for us or bad? If you didn't sleep, what would happen to you? You become like a zombie, right? You've tried that before? Some people get almost intoxicated without drinking anything. Just the way they behave, it's like, you know, he's not, he's not the same person I knew before. Why? For us, part of the perfection of وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Part of our perfection is that Allah Azza wa Jal وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا But when it comes to Allah, is that perfection or a defect? لا تَقُدُهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا نَوْمٌ So what is for the creation, a perfection, for Allah it is a defect. We do not attribute it to Allah. And the other way around, pride. Is it, is it a defect in a human being or a praiseworthy characteristic? Defect. It's a defect. For Allah, it is perfection. Al-Jabbar al-Mutakabbir. Because it's Allah, He deserves it. For the creation who's, who are made out of, you know what? We don't deserve it. So this must be understood when we look at this. So we will know the difference between us and Allah. So when we affirm these things to Allah, do not think of someone like yourself and say, but how can Allah have face? How can Allah have hands? How can Allah have eyes? Because you, Habibi, have defects. But to Allah, this is perfection. Because He described Himself in this fashion. Now, let us look at the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah further. We said we believe then in what Allah described Himself with and what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu described him with, let us add something. مِنْ غَيْرِ تَحْرِيفٍ وَلَا تَعْطِيلٍ وَمِنْ غَيْرِ تَكْيِيفٍ وَلَا تَمْثِيلٍ أَوْ تَشْبِيهٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَحْرِيفٍ تحريف is distortion to distort something and basically, let me give you some definition it means changing as in abandoning the meaning understood and accepting another one which the words may indicate in a doubtful sense. Example. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى العرش. You know what the, the people of misguidance say concerning this ayah? They say istawla means istawa means istawla and istawla means to take over, to conquer. So because they wanted to supposedly they wanted to, you know, free Allah from attributing to him what to them was a human quality, which is to rise over something. So they denied it and they said what istiwa means, it's istawla. Now, this is called tahrif. Because they've distorted the meaning. Now there's another kind of tahrif distorting the, the actual terminology. As in the case of the Jews, يحرفون الكلام عن مواضعه they distort, they displace the words from their original position. For example, some of the, uh, the deviants, they said that Allah did not speak to Musa. They denied Allah speaking to Musa. You know what they said? Uh, one of them, he came across a alim writing down some, some notes concerning that. And he was writing the ayah, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah spoke to Musa directly. So that deviant told the shaykh, he said, write it with the fatha. So it becomes, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ Now if you don't know grammar, let me tell you what that means. In English you have a subject, a verb, and an object. The boy ate the apple. Okay? In English, in Arabic we have فعل, فعل, ومفعول به. Now the difference is, in Arabic you probably see the vowels. ضمة, Fatha, Kasra, Sukun, or Double Dhamma, Double Fatha, Double Kasra. These actually are to be placed on the word depending on its grammatical position in the sentence. It is not haphazard or according to one's own choice. Yani, you cannot say Alhamdulillahi, Awlillahu, Rabb al Alameen. It's not up to you. You have to say Alhamdulillahi, Rabb al Alameen because it's Muqtada al Akhri. It has a grammatical Position like parts of speech, adjectives, adverbs, nouns, ilahiri. You must stick to that. Now, when you say kallam Allah, who? This makes the term Allah the fa'il. The, 
the subject of the sentence. However, in Arabic, if you made that dhamma fatha, it makes it the object of the sentence. So it becomes, instead of saying, Allah spoke to Musa, it becomes Musa spoke to Allah. It becomes Musa spoke to Allah. So he wanted to distort the tahrif, the love, to change the vowel so they can avoid it. So the Sheikh told him, so what are you going to say with إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ تُوَى What are you going to do with Allah said? When his Lord called on him, called on Musa. That one you can't distort. You cannot say نَادَاهُ رَبَّهُ It doesn't make any sense. So he refuted him right then and there. The other famous tahrif distortion is in the ma'na. So they say, hands mean sustenance, risk, and, uh, or might. They say it means the might. And the face means the glory. And every attribute of Allah, they give it another meaning, distorting the meaning they're in. Twisting the meaning around so it can be in agreement with their philosophy. We don't believe in this tahrif. We do not believe in the tahrif. We take it as it is, no distortion. The second thing which I assume Surah Jama'ah do not do is Ta'atil. Wa bi'irin wa attala. Ta'atil. Bi'irin wa la bi'irun? Bi'irin, alhamdulillah. A well, which is dysfunctional. Mu'attala actually is something dysfunctional. Like your car is mu'attala, meaning it doesn't work. And ta'atil means to desert and forsake. Also, to leave, to desert and forsake. Uh, which means to reject wholly or partly the names and attributes which Allah affirmed for Himself through tahrif or through juhud, which is outright denial. Tahrif is with the evidence, while ta'atil ta is, is by what it is proven by the evidence. Yeah. When you say tahrif, you're trying to twist around the actual ayah itself. Ta'atil is when you deny the implication of the ayah. Meaning you say that this ayah does not mean that. Allah says something and you go and you, you put an end. You deny what Allah Azawajal had affirmed to Himself. So Allah affirmed Hayat, they deny it. Allah affirmed Sama, Sama and Basar. What did He say to Musa and Harun? Innani ma'akuma Asma'u wa ara. I am with you, I hear and I see. So they do ta'atil, they say Allah neither hears nor does he see. So Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah do not do tahrif by twisting the meaning, distorting the meaning, they do not do ta'atil by denying what it implies, they leave it as it is. And we don't have tafweed. Tafweed is to say Allahu A'la. Which is, some philosophers came up with this idea. Say, look, play it safe. Let's play it safe. We just say we don't know. We know, we neither approve and affirm, nor do we deny. We say this is unacceptable. Because Allah says, in the Quran, وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ And we have sent down upon you the Quran, the, the book, as an exposition of everything. It explains everything. If you say that I don't know, meaning the Quran doesn't explain everything. But it does. So don't do tafweed, meaning I don't know what it means, no. Allah has a face, Allah has a face. You better take it and accept it and go with it for the rest of your life. Don't say it may, maybe. Maybe Allah has a face, maybe He does not. No, this is not acceptable. This is a form of ibtida and dalal, which we will reject. Thirdly, no takif. And this is where we have an issue. Takif is from kaif. Have you heard someone say kaif halak? Okay, what does it mean kaif halak? How are you? So what is the point here? How? We don't speak about the how. Some, some of the brothers who are involved in da'wah and translation, they came up with a new English word, which I couldn't find in dictionaries, howness. Right? They said the howness. It sounded nice, but I don't you know. I made my little research, I, I found that there's no such word in the English language. I mean, you have uniqueness, greatness, but howness, it doesn't exist. Inshallah, maybe they will add it in the future, courtesy for the Muslims and the Aqeelah and the Sunnah and Jama'ah. We deserve it, why not? Anywho, so we don't speak about the how. And the truth of the matter is, I tell you what, how is none of your business. How is none of your business to say how. Because when Imam Malik was sitting with his students, and a Mukta there walked into the masjid, he said, Ya Imam! How did the most 
most merciful rise over his throne. Imam Malik rahimahullah, he put his head down until perspiration started to trickle down his forehead. He got sweaty because of the gravity of the question. It was like a heavy load. That's a big question. Where did you come from with that question? So then he picked up his head and he said, Al-Istiwa'u ghayru majhul. The term istiwa is not something which is unknown. We know what it means. Of course, the ulama have different in what Imam said in verbatim. But the meaning, al-istiwa, some of them say istiwa or ma'loom. Ma fi mushkila, ma'loom or ghayr majhul. Wal kayfu ghayr ma'loom. How? It is unknown. Wal imanu bihi wajib. For you to believe in that is obligatory. Wa su'alu anhu bid'a. And for you to ask is an innovation. Wa ma araka illa mubtadi'a. And I see that you're not but an innovator. And he commanded his students to throw this man out the masjid. Out. Why? Because the people were doing fine without having to think how Allah rules over the throne. Now here's the most beautiful answer which everyone here should memorize. When we come to this point, when we come to this point, how do you explain to someone that we shouldn't dwell into these issues? That we believe in them, but we don't dwell. If someone says, but I need to know this is knowledge, this is ilm, we say time out. Do you consider me, the question, whoever that, let's say you, tell the person, do you consider me as someone who's knowledgeable? He will say, yes, otherwise I wouldn't have asked you. Say, excellent. Who do you think is more knowledgeable of Allah? I or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He will say, A'udhu Billah! The Messenger of Allah, of course! You don't know anything! You're a jahil! Compared to the Messenger of Allah, say, good! I agree with you, I am jahil! Compared to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now, you compare, to, you compare the question with the Messenger of Allah, it's a lie that he's nothing! Excellent! Next question. Um, you seem to be excited about learning the deen. Aren't you? Says, yes, of course. Say, are you more keen on learning or the Sahaba? You say, no, no, I mean, of course I'm trying to learn, you know, I have five minutes a day when I, you know, search through Google for Islamic information, but I don't think I'm doing as good as the Sahaba. The Sahaba, they sacrifice their whole lives to learn the deen. Say, excellent. So now we've agreed that I am far less knowledgeable than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you're way less concerned and keen on learning the deen than the Sahaba. Agreed? Say agreed. Say okay. If one who knew Allah the most was available and amongst those who wanted to learn the deen the most, yet they never had this conversation, they never asked this question, then why are you asking me? Do you get it? Meaning when you ask me, you're not better than the Sahaba, and I am not better than the Messenger of Allah. If he wasn't asked, and he could have answered the best, the fact that he could have had given the best answer, and the people who wanted the knowledge the most were there, they never had this conversation, why are you having this conversation? And that will silence anyone who has a bit of brain left. If he argues after that, just walk in the opposite direction. You are, you are with a feeble-minded person. Ma'lish. Because this is something that cannot be argued. It's irrefutable. If, yani, understand now, reflect the jama'ah. The sahaba. Don't you think they heard seven times, seven times in the Quran, the istiwa of Allah over the throne? They heard it seven times. It occurs seven times in the book of Allah, the rising of Allah over the throne. You don't think any one of them was interested enough to go to the Messenger of Allah and say, Ya Rasulullah, ma huwa al-istiwa? Kayfa astawa Allah? Why? Because they had adab with Allah. They knew their limitations with Allah. They knew laysa kamithli shay and they stopped right there. So there's nothing better for you to do what they did, stop right there. Do not say how, or let's say the manner. The manner is none of our business. Why? Because if Allah wanted us to know, He would have revealed the fact that He rose over the throne and how He rose over the throne. If He revealed that He did rise over the throne without the how, meaning He wants you to know the first, He doesn't want you to know the second. Why are you asking about something which Allah doesn't want you to know? Do you get the rationale? Alhamdulillah. And lastly, Tamthil, which is uh, Basically mentioning similarities 
or likening Allah to His creation. Now, let us take some fundamental ayat which all of you either memorize already or will memorize soon. The one which all of you know is, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوا Can anyone give us the English translation of the meaning of this ayah, Barakallahu Feek, in an with accurate terminology? Anyone? Anyone interested in us? وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوا And how do you translate that to English? Nothing like Nice one. But that's closer to Laysa Kabithi Hishay. That's actually Laysa Kabithi Hishay. There's nothing like unto him. Walam Yakullahu Kufurahad usually is translated differently. At least if I remember correctly, Sahih International, which is the most reliable translation of the meaning of the Quran. Sahih International is the most reliable, inshallah. Aqeera sound, manage sound, terminology sound, simple language, we're not Shakespeare. You know, thou shall this and thou shall the people don't speak no thou anymore, Habibi. So you know, keep the language in the language of the people, Ma'alish. And in that one you read the one of the other guys, what is this man? You know, this sounds like the Bible. And you know, Jimmy Swagger. Anyways, and there's none co-equal or comparable unto him. That's the translation of walam yakullahu kufarahat. There's none co-equal or comparable unto him. So we all know what that means. Meaning there's nothing like Allah. Laysa kabithi shay. Again, now there's nothing like unto him. Wa huwa sami'u al-basir. And he is the all hearing, all seeing. Allah refuted two groups. The mushabiha and the mu'attila. He refuted the mushabiha by saying, Laysa kabithi shay. Those who like Allah's his creation, Allah said there's nothing like him. And if you read the Mu'attila who say Allah doesn't see it here by saying, Wa huwa Samir al-Basir. One ayah or even part of an ayah, Surah Al-Shura ayah number 11, Allah refuted both deviant groups amongst the Muslims. Anyways, we know what that means. Hal ta'lamu lahu samiya. Do you know of anyone who is like him? Again, all of these ayat teach us that there's nothing like Allah Azza wa Jal. So on what basis are you likening Allah to his creation? And I'm going to give you a quick example. I hope it will make sense to you. Listen. Let's say I have something under the desk here. Or is that a table? The table. And that thing is called Halulu Balulu. But remind me because I usually remember the word that I come up with. Because I always come up with them, you know, extemporaneously. Halulu Balulu, was it? But now I say to you, uh, have you seen the Halulu Balulu? And um, you will say, no, no, obviously not. Uh, what, is, what does usually happen? What usually happens, what do you tell me? Describe it for us. But now, if Halulu Balulu was similar to something which you know, then I would obviously give you that thing which you know, and, I, and as soon as I give it to you, for example, let's say it was a cell phone. Let's say it was a Nokia. Or, uh, I don't want Nokia, okay, HTC. Let's say there's a new HTC. And you have an HTC cell phone. iPhone, I don't like iPhones. So I say to you, look, do you know the old HTC, for example, the P3400? What happens to you? What will happen in your mind? You will create an image of the P3400, like old HTC. I tell you the new version, okay, or the new model, is similar to the old one, however, they made the screen wider. So your brain, with the pre-existing image of the cell phone which you know, you will start to develop a new image according to what? The new description. Bigger buttons, wider screen, different colors, whatever. Now after I give you six to seven new features, you have developed what? An image. Now if I say this to all of you, what are the chances of two people developing the same exact image? None. What are the chances that two of you will have the exact same new idea in your brain? When I say wider screen, where do you think this is a wider screen? Like the galaxy, or like this, or like that, or maybe an inch, or a millimeter, you don't know. The colors, the size, the buttons, the keyboard, anything I say, no two people will be able to come up with an image that is identical. And when I show you the phone, you're going to say, whoa, I had
had something totally different in mind. Right or wrong? Right. Now this is concerning what? Something which you have what? Seen. So when I try to teach you something, or you try to teach someone something, you give him a pre-existing image, then you add to it. But my halulu balulu was it? My halulu balulu. You say, uh, brother, is it uh, is it you know some some device? No. Is it an animal? No. Um, is it a, is it what? Is it a vehicle? No. Is it a fruit? No. Is it a vegetable? No. 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 I tell you, it's big. So what what would happen to your brains? You have nothing already existing, so big to you is this big, and this one is this big, and the other one is that big. Of course, the desk will have a limitation. Assuming I told you it was hiding outside, you will think of different sizes. I tell you it's nice. You will think of various levels of niceness, if that exists. And the list goes on. Now, what are the chances of all of you agreeing or being actually able to depict and visualize my description? Never, ever. So, ya akhwan, when Allah says there is nothing like unto Him, meaning you have never seen anything like Allah. Nothing like Allah. So think about that example. When Allah says that His names and attributes, Al-Wajr, Al-Yadayn, Al-Aynayn, you have nothing for you to use as a pre-existing image for you to even compare. And even if there was, you would still fail. What about when there isn't? Laysa kamithlihi shay. So you believe, but you know your limitations. Is that clear? So when Allah says, Laysa kamithlihi shay, meaning you need to understand that what Allah described Himself with in the Quran is special and unique to Him. And it can never be like anything that you thought of. Because even when we say head, the elephant may have a head, and the ant has a head, and the cat has a head. And the, the, sometimes the table, the, the handle, a hand. And a human being has a hand. What, are they, what is the commonality between them? The term hand. The essence is different. So if there's a variation between the creation, when we use one unique common term, one common term, then what about the vastness and the difference between the creator and the creation? So don't think because Allah said hands, it's human being hands. You have no right to do so. I hope that is clear. So that is the concept. Now let us sum it up over here. Uh, now, what are the behavioral benefits? What do we benefit? We say, okay, I've learned this. What, what, is, what, is, in it, is, what is in it for me? I say, number one, Habibi, congratulations. Congratulations for being upon the sound aqidah of God the Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in. Why? Because anyone who claims otherwise, and I'm doing it publicly, on the you know, camera, which will be online inshallah, I challenge anyone to produce a single evidence from any one of the Sahaba who denied any of the attributes of Allah. Sound evidence. Any one of them saying Allah doesn't have eyes, or Allah doesn't have hands, or Allah doesn't have face, anyone bring one single evidence. We challenge you. You will never be able to do it. The fact that you can bring this evidence means they believed in the apparent meaning of the text. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught them and he taught them well. So the first thing is now you are upon the right Aqeedah. Which means that you know who Allah is. Secondly, when we know that the fact that Allah Azawajal not only has names like the Mu'tazila but actually has attributes then you can feed Him correctly. When you know Allah sees you then you will be afraid of doing that, which is not pleasing to him because he sees you. When you know Allah hears you, you'll be afraid to say something which is displeasing to him because you know Allah hears you. And the list goes on. When Allah has knowledge of everything, you know Allah knows what's in your heart. And so on and so forth. It will affect your iman. In salah, you know who you're worshipping. You're not worshipping someone who's unknown, nor are you worshipping someone who, who they claim is everywhere and who not exist and not existent and they don't even, they cannot even define. Lastly, this Aqeedah should be the common belief system of every Muslim if we wish to be united again. 
if the Muslims wish to be a single united Ummah as it was early in the early generations then as Imam, Sadiq said, Imam Malik rahimahullah said and none will rectify the, the later part of this Ummah except that which rectified the former if we wish to be united as Muslims as an Ummah then we all need to agree concerning this Aqeedah because this is from the things which where difference is not really permissible you can differ on fiqh you can differ on understanding a particular hadith and its implications pertaining to other matters or some lighter matters of aqidah like did the messenger of Allah see, see Allah or did he not see Allah or you know about the grave is it the punishment of the body and the soul or is it only the body or only the soul the Ahl Sunnah and Jamaah are different on these minor issues of aqidah but the major issues of aqidah there is no room for difference you cannot believe Allah is everywhere while I believe He's above His throne, above the seven heavens. You cannot believe Allah doesn't have a face while He believes Allah has a face. Everyone has to believe what the Qur'an taught. You read the Qur'an and you set aside your philosophy, then you have no choice but to believe in the ayat which Allah revealed. Which describe Allah's face and Allah's sap, the, the shin of Allah Azza wa Jal, and the hands of Allah and the eyes of Allah, and so on and so forth. Allah comes, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكِ صفا صفا. All of these are clear cut ayat about Allah Azza wa Jal describing Himself in a particular manner which we accept and we submit to without distorting the meaning, without denying the meaning, without saying how it happens because we don't know and without likening Allah to His creation. So I invite all the Muslims in the world, beginning with you brothers here and sisters to give some time for this aspect of our deen. A lot of time is spent on, let's say, trivial issues if they are concerning Islam, let alone if they are spent on issues that are not even concerned Islam. While this major, profound aspect of our deen has been neglected. Those who know the Sam Aqeedah may be counted on the fingers again. Those who can give you evidences, not only have a general understanding to really know it because more of us need to learn with the evidences so we may teach others. It's good to save yourself, but you need to save your family. You need to save your community. You need to save those who are close to you. So we must learn. Give it some time. If you wish for something local, you're invited every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha in Hayy al Mushrifa Da'wa Center for a special class concerning al aqeedah al-Wasitiyya li Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah with the sharh of Shaykh Muhammad bin Salih bin Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala you will get the whole zubda as they say the butter, the summary, the juice of it, the whole thing the gist of it is the whole thing is available every Saturday no freeze, no registration, no one will even speak to you if you wish to come silent and leave silent we have no problem or only salam. Give salam and leave. But at least give it some time. If not, inshallah soon our website will be uh, available with all of these mp3 files which you have missed available on the website. So you can easily go there and download them as mp3 files and listen to them while you go and coming back. Everything is explained alhamdulillah in detail. But the idea is give it some time. I recommend the website sahifa.org S-A-H-W-E-F-A-H.org If I remember the spelling correctly, it's an excellent website which deals with the names and attributes of Allah. And I believe there's another, another one called overthethrone.com You can easily find these sites. But give some time for the aqeedah of the sunnah al-jama'ah because it is the means of salvation bi-idhnillahi azza wa jal on yawm al-qiyamah wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya muhammad If you have any questions in regards to the lecture please ask if they are not relevant to the lecture then forgive us The scope of Ahl sunnah al-jama'ah or they're outside of the scope of Ahl sunnah They're outside of the scope of Ahl sunnah al-jama'ah even though they are claimants to the Aqeedah of Al-Sunnah Al-Jama'ah If you read the, the Sharh of Shaykh Al-Taymin of Al-Aqeedah Al-Wasitiyah He explicitly says that they are not of Al-Sunnah Al-Jama'ah Because how can they differ on these things and be labeled under one title? Okay, okay. They're not Okay, but the, uh, uh, is there anything where it says that if Ahl Al-Athar, Aqeedah, Salafiyah, Aqeedah, Athariyah are not found 
then the Ashaira take their place? Like the Ashaira are the closest from the groups to us? Well, they are the least deviant. I wouldn't say they're the closest. And, and, and uh, I, I, you know, to be particular about the term Salafiya, we are not speaking of any sect here. Yeah, let's stick to something else. But just for the crowd, we are, don't call for any group. Don't say you're a Salafi, call yourself a Salafi and join SalafiTalk.net and go fetching for all the misguided Muslims in the world. It's not part of our way and that's not what we like, nor is it something which we call to. Yes, we want the way of the Salaf, but I'm not, he, when he says Salafiya, it's not the uh, Neo-Salafis who today have formed their own group and they have their own set of deviances and problems which we ask Allah to rectify. But yes, they are the least deviant amongst them but they still if they if they still are not ahl sunnah wal jama'ah because they will go to ahl sunnah because of their strict adherence to the sunnah jama'ah li anna mujtama'u ala dhalik they agree upon that so they don't agree on that sunnah okay now there's from the from the scholars of the past like imam nawawi and imam ibn hajar who has the greatest uh, uh, explanation of say bukhari no doubt nah. hajar has the best uh, uh, they were they were known to be a shahid. Correct. So, so how can we take in from them when they're a shahid? That's the main question. Here the ulama say that uh, when a alim does ishtihad or he has some errors in a particular uh, aspect of the deen, we point out their errors, but we don't undermine their effort and their soundness in other aspects of the deen, the sound understanding. Because we can't go to extremes here. We say yes, when it comes to Aqeedah, you have to be careful of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah and Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Now, we, you be careful. If you're a student of knowledge, you have the sound Aqeedah, you have no problem reading their material because you know what is correct and what is not correct. But for the average person, he has to be a little more careful. Okay, so with, with, with that said, that means modern day callers, like let's say for example, modern day Asha'ir, like Hamza Yusuf for example, uh, we can take certain things, not aqidah. We can take, for example, fiqh. We can take mawa'idha, spirituality, but not necessarily aqidah from certain modern day culture. No, we cannot. Because we cannot compare Hamza Yusuf to Imam Nawawi. I know, I'm saying like, you know, like just, just a uh, rule. Of uh, yes, if a person, if a person's aqidah, look, if there was lack of uh, availability of other alternatives, then perhaps there will be some sort of rukhsa. But with all the callers on the scene to the correct aqidah, then we are in no need of referring to someone who has Sufi tendencies with the wrong aqidah and some shirkiyat concerning the Messenger of Allah and Qasidat al burda wa ila akhirihim al ashya. We do not forsake or compromise, you know, because for mawidah. The mawidah is the book of Allah. So the bottom line is, we do not apply this today. This is what the ulama concluded amongst two of the greatest imams in Islam, which we cannot deny. Imam, a caller of a you know, modern you know, day caller, then we have to have serious reservations and we just say, leave the whole, leave him alone. Make dua that Allah brings him to the truth so he can benefit from his other skills, but until then, you don't listen to him, you don't take knowledge from him. There was one maqul of Shaykh al-Albani, he said about, uh, he was asked about the Sha'rawi, Imam Sha'rawi in Egypt. Uh, he said, For the one who's a, for who? He's speaking to Tullab al or to Ahmad al Nas? To, 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 now we're addressing common people. Nah, Students of knowledge, they have their own set of instructions, they have their own, uh, uh, you know, observations, they have their own abilities to, uh, to distinguish between things. But the common people, they can't do all that. They listen to the guy, he's not going to know this is fiqh, this is mawridah, this is aqidah. He's going to take the whole thing mumble jumble. And he's going to leave with something odd, which is in disagreement to this act. So for the common people, leave the whole guy alone. If he has issues, Allah gave you something, you know, something else to make up for that. If you became a student of knowledge and you have the ability to point out the good and bad, talk about Barakallah That was another lecture, Amr Wapir. Naam Akhi. Uh, the ulama say it is acceptable, yet they recommend that you learn what you want to make dua concerning in Arabic. But it does not invalidate the salah. The reason being that the whole concept of ibadah 
is not a bunch, of, a bunch of rituals. It is a dynamic relationship between you and Allah. And sometimes your dua is not necessarily what is available in the Quran and the Sunnah. You may have a particular need. And Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, you know, knows all languages because He created them. And so there's, وَلَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا أُسْعَهَا Allah will not burden you beyond your ability and scope. You do not know the Arabic language. So that is not expected of you. You may make dua in your own language. In Salah also. In Salah. Sujood in Salah, obviously. That is a first one. Outside Salah and inside Salah, it doesn't matter. But the general recommendation is don't remain ignorant of the Arabic language. Learn and then avoid it as long as you're able to avoid it. If you cannot avoid it, in Salah or outside Salah, you may make dua in any language. In Sujood or before the Taslim, you're, you're doubtful, huh? No, you just make it sure. No, no, there was a discussion recently that some people are saying you cannot uh, certificate to Allah in the language. Tell him, give me the evidence. Tell him, give me the evidence. In Sujood, they have to speak it only in Arabic. Why? Give me the evidence. I haven't known. Whatever people want to make such observations, say, give me your textual evidence that says you are not permitted to make dua in any other language. If there isn't an evidence, it becomes a matter of ishtihad. So the ulama will go to fundamentals in Islam, like the ones I gave you, and then they will see the maslaha and the mafsada. If there's a clear cut evidence, no one has the right to debate. If the Messenger of Allah said, don't make dua in any language other than Arabic, it's the end of the story. But if there isn't anything, now we look. What is the objective of ibad? What is the objective of salah? What is the objective of dua? What is the relationship between you and Allah? How does Islam look at languages? Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ الْقَوْمِهِ لُيُمَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We never sent the messenger except with the same language as the people he's inviting, so he may explain to them. So we know that there's flexibility. And Allah says, among the ayat, اِخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ The change, the variation, the, the, uh, the, the differences in your tongue, in your languages. This is from the ayat of Allah. So it is not something that is blameworthy to come and make it haram when there's no evidence. If they want to be safe, say Jazakallah khairan. But don't come and say, I'm not allowed to do it. Because you don't have an evidence which says that it is totally haram. Same thing with Qutbat al-Jum'ah in English or other languages, and the list goes on. Now, Jazakallah khair. We'll catch you later. Subhanakallah, Muhammadik, Shadu Allah, Ilaha 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 Ilaha